Welcome back to the manor. Julian McBain here, and today we are um, apparently not tracking our codex. I must have missed that the last couple of play sessions. What the hell? There we go. Um, okay, actually, I have something I want to talk about that's that's a bit interesting. I've covered it a bit before, but I'm very interested to see what's going to be coming next. We got, it is going to kind of border on the political, but it's not strictly speaking a political issue. It just happens to involve that because it doesn't the whole world. Um, but the the main reason I haven't been talking on philosophy lately is because most of that was when, when, I, when I was doing a lot of the... Uh, I was watching a lot of psychology lectures, right? And of course, I need to dis feel I need the need to discuss it because that's how I process things, as you all know. And am I? I think I'm not a drugs. I'm not a drugs. It's a damn good thing I'm not monetized. That that right there would have totally done it. So let's pop a neuro boost and a loot pill. And uh, let's get going. So um. What I have been doing lately is I've been reading and listening to a lot of theology, which, as you all know, religion is one of the things I try to avoid as a regular topic. Um, but you know what? If you want me to broach the topic, leave a comment and let me know. Um, because theology to me is extremely interesting. It's as interesting, if not more interesting, than psychology, although I think that theology is actually... You know what? I'm going to abandon what my original plan for this video was because it's a good topic, but you know what? I think this is a better topic to broach tonight. Um, where theology is, in my opinion, might be couched in psychology. So let's we'll talk about that. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome to the manor. Please take a moment and subscribe down below. We're on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time, so make sure you subscribe. Also, make sure you go to patreon.com slash julianmcbain if you want to support my work. If you do, you get exclusive content every single month delivered. And yes, I am aware that it is coming to the end of October, and I have not made my October video. Patrons, don't worry. I shall deliver. I'll try to make sure it's within the month that the video was supposed to be for this time. Sorry about that. So, okay. Theology. Theology, of course, is the study of deity. Actually, it's a little more than that. It's the specific um, doctrine behind... Actually, you know what? Let's get a definition. The study of the nature of God and religious belief. Um, religious beliefs and theory when systematically developed. So every, every religion or faith generally has a theology behind it. Um, Christianity obviously does in its various numerous denominations. Judaism does, which um, Christianity, Christianity is actually based off of, of course. Um, Islam does. Hinduism does. Shintoism does. I think even to, perhaps to a lesser extent, Buddhism does. Because I'm not convinced that Buddhism is a religion so much as a philosophy. Because I've met people of other religions following Buddhist philosophy. So I'm not 100%. I think it can be, I think it can, it might be the only religion, um, the only philosophy that can whole, replace religion whole as a moral basis, a basis for morality. Because re regardless of what you think, the, mora the morals that you hold dear are based in some sort of, mor of religious background. And that is provably true. Um, in the Middle East, it's mostly Islam. In the West, it's mostly Judeo-Christianity. In the um, Far East, like in um, uh, Asia, you've got Buddhism, you've got Shintoism. Um, actually, you've got a variety of religions there. It's a very religiously diverse area, believe it or not. But Buddhism is probably the most widespread, if I had to make a guess. Um, I'm probably wrong about that. If, if any of you have spent time in Southeast Asia, correct me. I'm, I'm, I'm begging you to correct me. And I'm sure that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of local religions, each with their own individual theologies and nuances. And, of course, Japan has Shintoism, 
which is a very unique and very interesting system. It actually, it, I've, I've actually studied it to a certain extent. Um, and it's, it's an extremely interesting system. But I believe that theology cannot exist without psychology. And I mean that very, in, in, a, in a technical sense. Because in a lot of ways, theology is the psychology of why you believe what you believe. And so as I'm diving into the theology of my own faith and I'm looking at things in a certain way and deciding, you know, how, how, if, if, if a certain concept is presented to me, does it make sense? Because I'm a very, I tend to be very reason oriented, logical, almost to a fault sometimes. And so if I cannot find a logical reason for something, I will go looking for it. And so with being able to dig into the actual theological basis, because there are thousands of books written on theology of probably every major religion on the planet and most of the minor ones, um, I have to make it make sense. And so far, the particular denomination I follow, which for those of you who you know actually care, it's the New Apostolic Faith, most of what I've found absolutely makes sense. And the things I have not yet made sense of, I have not had time to research. And so, and so to me, that's good because that's very important. If you're going to follow a faith, it needs to, it needs to have meaning to you. And, and I think part of it's also because I don't take, I don't take my scripture as literal history per se. And I know that there are, there are clergy, there are clergy, you know, there are pastors and priests that will disagree with me, but I believe the purpose of it is to teach a lesson. There is a truth there, but that doesn't mean it's historical fact. And there are going to be some historical facts, but it's it's distilled truth packed into a story. And that's where I can run with it because the, the psychological basis of, say, the Bible stories or the Quran stories, if you take just a little bit of time, very easy to see. And yes, I have read bit parts of the Quran. I actually have one. Actually, it's in my hand now. Um, and of what I've read, there is a lot of meaning in it. Now, does that make me a Muslim? No. But I can find meaning in the stories of other faiths and appreciate the theology of those faiths without necessarily agreeing with them. I think that's something that a lot of people miss is that they they assume that if say you read the Quran or you read the Bible you have to accept it as literal truth or you don't believe and that's absolutely incorrect. It's understanding the moral framework underlying the stories told. And And that's where the psychology bit comes in. Because that moral framework shapes how you live your life. And the things that shape how you live your life is 100% psychologically based. Because this is how you're taught. It's the repetition over and over. It's behavioral, it's cognitive behavioral conditioning from the time you are a baby till now. And theology has done that for literally thousands of years. Like ever since the first sun religions ever cropped up in hunter-gatherer villages, this is the the basis for what formed you know Mesopotamian faiths, and it was it was all the same stories. If you go back, like um, if you go through the Epic of Gilgamesh, you'll find at least five or six stories that parallel the Bible, particularly Genesis. It's very very interesting. Uh, the flood tale, for instance, you know you've got. No, in the Bible, there's a similar tale in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the moral of the story is the same. That's how old these things are. And I mean, how old, how long ago was the Epic of Gilgamesh written? It was written during the friggin' Babylonian times. Um, getting fucking Microsoft notifications. Hopefully that didn't pop up on your screen, guys. 
Um, what, what's, let's see, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which by the way is a long ass story. Um, written circa 2100 to 1200 BC. So there's some, uh, some basis for you. About 4,000 years ago. You know, we think ancient. That's ancient. And the truths behind the stories in the epic have not changed. The moral lessons you learned from the epic of Gilgamesh have not changed. They are very, very important. They've just been... They've been read. They've been rewritten. They've been filtered through a more modern lens, perhaps. But they're all the same. And that's the psychological framework behind a theology. Because, of course, the epic of Gilgamesh is not a religious text, per se. It's a philosophical one. That's for damn sure. But... It is, it's not necessarily a religious text like, say, the Bible or the Koran, but it's a, it's a philosophical basis because they taught moral lessons. And those moral lessons are couched in the stories that, uh, of Gilgamesh's adventures. And I, I strongly recommend you go read it. Um, I've read bits and pieces of it. Like I said, it's an incredibly long poem. It is not the easiest read in the world. And I'm someone who can read some pretty difficult shit. You know, as a Freemason, I've had to read things in Middle English. And if you ever, like, if you think Shakespeare is hard and Shakespeare wrote in Middle English, if you're reading, like, authentic Shakespeare, yeah, that was late Middle English. I've read some early Middle English, and it's damn near German, okay? And, and I'm not saying I did so easily or readily. Some of it I could not understand, because I am not a scholar in Old English languages, and if you ever see a text in Old English, it's very doubtful you'll be able to understand it. That is how how much we have developed our language over the last 2,000 years or so, which English, of course, is much younger than that. But uh, Old English might be... How long ago did Old English develop? Let's find that out. Old English. Um, oh, pa. Uh, pre-12th century. Um, yeah, it, it lasted from 450 AD until about 1150 AD when it got completely uh, supplanted by French and Middle English, thanks to the Normans. Which, you know, then French was the popular court language until everyone realized that French is completely made up. I'm going to get killed by some Quebecois coming down on a friggin' uh, vendetta for me making fun of the French language. But hey, you know what? My last name is French. Y'all know what McBain ain't my real last name. My last name's Valorant. Y'all know that. You've owned that for a while. That cat got let out of the bag when I became a politician. But Valorant is a very French name. I can make fun of the national origin of my name. Or the linguistic origin of my name. Um, but anyway, so going back, you know, you've got you've got these stories that are just like you don't we don't know how old the origin of these stories are. And actually they explore this concept in an anime called um Fate Stay Night, where the ancient heroes are summoned by wizards to do battle against each other, and the pe person who wins gets the Holy Grail, which, um, yeah, I'm not going to spoil it because it's a damn good show and you ought to watch it. But all my weeb, friend all my weeb viewers are like, yeah, and everyone else is like, ugh. Um, but, you know, you've got, um, like, King Arthur is there, and you've got... Um, the hero of Ireland whose name escapes me. And um, you've got a number of others. Morgana Le Fay. And then you get Gilgamesh. And he lays it out. And Gilgamesh is like, you pulled the sword from a stone. But I pulled that same sword from a tree. And that same sword. The sword that names the king. And in the, in the tale of Arthur, it's the king of knights. Right? 
pulls a sword from a stone. The sword and the stone originates from... Oh, it does technically originate from the Gilgamesh story if you go back far enough. But if you also read, like, Genesis, when Adam and Eve fall, God locks the gate of Eden with a flaming sword struck into the ground, a stone, to prevent the gates from opening. Same idea. Because what does Arthur do? Arthur creates Camelot. What's Camelot? A utopia against chaos. Same idea. Same moral framework. And those moralities create the psychology of how we raised our kids generation after generation. It's the same morality I used to raise my son, even though I was not raised in a religious background. Believe it or not. But it's, but those teachings is how, you know, even outside of the, the auspices of a, of a religion, those same moral precepts were taught to me. We just use different stories. But their, their foundations were the same. That's the psychology of it. That's how we build those frameworks. It's very, very interesting. And I think that the, the purpose of theology could almost be said to be the basis of psychology. Theology is the basis of psychology, but also vice versa. It's like a chicken and egg thing because without psychology, theology wouldn't work. Without psychology, theology would not work. But without theology, the psychology of how we do things could not be inculcated into society. Because that's how we do it. So if I had to make a guess, I think the two are inextricably and fundamentally linked. You can't have one without the other. Because if you lose one, the other will perish. Oh, got too close to the uh, turret. And you know what? I would be... If anyone... If anyone stumbling across my channel watching this who is a professional in either, whether you're a minister or a religious scholar or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, if you listening to this disagree with my assessment, I would love to know why in the comments. And if you're just a lay person who disagrees with me, I would love to know why in the comments. Because in my opinion, there's really no such thing as just the lay person. That's utter bullshit. I don't care who is trying to gatekeep the foundations of knowledge and, you know, trust the expert nonsense. People are smart. If you're willing to take the time and do real research, you can figure it out. Any subject. Absolutely any subject. So long as you have the right tools. And anyone who tells you otherwise, they're trying to sell you a bridge. And they're trying to gatekeep because they don't want you to come up with an idea that's, um, that's counter to whatever narrative they're trying to sell. And I mean that completely apolitically. I don't care what, po what, what political foundations you have or beliefs you have. I don't care what uh, religious beliefs you have. If someone tells you to ignore the evidence that you see, if you're doing actual research, I'm not talking meme smithing, I'm talking like actually going through and reading articles and stuff, and you're analyzing the shit, and you're formulating opinions in your head based on your analysis, it may not be perfect, but it's still legit. And if they can prove you wrong, because these same people say, believe the experts, but don't actually go out and look things up themselves. And they can't produce the evidence that the experts produce because nine times out of... And then if, if it's behind a paywall, they'll give you paywalls. And if you produce a paywall article, they'll say, well, it's behind a paywall, so it doesn't count. This has actually happened to me. So tell them to go stuff it. I want to hear from the lay people too. But I've come to the conclusion you can't have one without the other. You need theology to have psychology, particularly the underlying foundational psychology of how society works. That requires theology. Now, does it require you follow a particular religion? No. But your, 
your beliefs and the foundations of the society you live in will be based upon the theology that underlies it. And there are probably a dozen extremely distinct theological bases or foundations and the rest are probably if, if I had to make a guess and this is this is an educated guess okay you know I've, I've studied theology a long time I've studied theologies of various religions for a long time you know back from from when I practiced other faiths and experimented with different religions, I had to learn their theologies to understand them and be willing to do it. And I have explored quite a few from various Christian denominations. I have looked at Judaism. I've never actually been to like temple. I've always wanted to go. And if I've ever given the opportunity, I will absolutely attend temple um, or at least go to synagogue. Cause you have to be, you know, you have to be in, if I, if I don't know this for sure, but as far as I remember, you have to be invited to temple, but, um, that's that's an opportunity I have not had yet is to go to a synagogue but I have been to pagan circles I have practiced with um, I have spoken to and um, practiced the some of the more ritualistic uh, manifestations of Buddhism I have looked through and attempted to practice Shintoism I know I got it wrong and I kept going back to the same place afterwards because I just because that was my moral foundation. So when I say that I've been studying it a long time from a lot of perspectives, I literally mean that. Um and that's why I think that theology and psychology are are tied to each other so they if they are not i think one sprouted from the other but i don't know which one's the chicken and which one's the egg and i don't know which one came first if i had to guess theology is what cre um the study of theology is what birthed psychology because i mean the study of psychology as an idea not as a systematic study, but as a, like, just using psychology, that's the basis of warfare, okay? A hundred percent. You can't do war without psychology. There is nothing more important than trying to instill terror into your enemy. That is, like, that. that's basic art of war. Preventing your enemy from wanting to fight so you can take a city without casualties. Or convincing them to join you. That's basic power dynamics. It is foundational psychology. It is the foundation of warfare. But I think the people who figured it out the, fir uh, the fir uh, earliest were the religious leaders. Because they were the ones who needed to convince people to follow a moral framework. And that's why I think that, if I had to guess, theology came first. And it's birthed psychology as a secular offspring. But you can't have theology without psychology. It's the, it's the framework of it. Um, so, non-secular psychology. Theology could be expressed as the non as non-secular psychology, or a component of theology is non-secular psychology, and then from that birth psychology. I think it's something like that. Hmm. Really not the direction I expected to go to take today, guys, because I was actually I've I have been stuck for topics. So I was actually gonna discuss crypto tonight, but I I like this topic better. I like this topic better. And I don't know Comment below if if you don't mind me going into more, um, into more religious stuff. I don't mind doing so, but I don't want to like lose my whole audience. And I've been told I'll oh, just do what feels right, and it's like eh, I tried that. I did the podcast, and like literally all my subscribing, my my subscriber count nosedived. So we'll see how that works. 
Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please like, share, and subscribe down below. We are on the road to 13 million subscribers, one subscription at a time, so make sure you subscribe. And as always, I really appreciate the support, and we will see you in the next one.